Hello, everyone. Um, I have to tell you that um, I'm personally pretty thrilled to be here because in addition to my, my WebMD gig, I'm actually a certified personal trainer just because I happen to be interested in the topic. So, <laughs> so the fact that we're here to talk about ways to help people continue to thrive and live healthy throughout the lifespan is just pretty remarkable, and I think we're all really thrilled to hear what our expert panel has to say. First, I wanted to start with a little bit of perspective um, from WebMD. We actually asked our audience to you know, share some questions, some comments about what was important to them when it comes to healthy aging, what questions they might have, and one in particular really struck a chord with me, and excuse my pronunciation, but Mr. Uh, Somesh Chandra Kakar, his comment was, as an elderly person, I would like society to facilitate in our efforts to remain a positive contributor to society that will enhance our self-esteem and give, a, give us a cause to live on. That's really the whole day today is about improving the lives of people to give them a reason, make them productive, give them meaning to their life. And you know, oftentimes as we, as we get older, our emotional and our physical and our mental health suffers because we're not able to do what we used to enjoy doing. And that's what we're really all here to talk about today is how can we continue to keep all of us thriving and how do we connect the young with the older Americans to continue to help all of us do what we love really for an entire lifespan. So, you know, Americans are living longer as we've been talking about and we're at a life expectancy of almost 79 years. And if today, if you're 65, a man can expect to live another 17 years, a woman can expect to live another 20 years. So we really need to do everything we can to not just help people live longer, but really help them thrive. Really, should, people should be active and healthy till the end, you know, till their lifetime is over. You really want to make those last few years as active and healthy as we possibly can. So, I'm absolutely thrilled to announce our panelists today, and let me start with a little bit of our celebrity right here. I could tell this morning everybody was taking a picture with you, and I'll get my picture with you after. Um, Diane and I had... personal trainer, but it was going to be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, I'll do our jumping jacks in a minute. Um, Diane and I had, most of you probably know, in 2013, she became the first person confirmed to swim from Florida to Cuba. Now, I think any of us would agree that's a pretty remarkable feat at any age, much less to do it at 63 years old. That's amazing. And if you didn't know, that's like 110 miles and like 53 hours of swimming. That's just crazy. But anyway, now some two years later, she's uh, strutting her stuff on Dancing with the Stars, I saw. And now she's really dedicating herself to just helping all of us be more active and motivating us. And I think your, your latest initiative is you're going to take us all on a, a walk across America. So, yes, everyone join Diana for that little walk. So. Uh, next we have, I'm going to go a little bit out of order, just my cards are a little out of order, Dr. Vivek Murthy, who um, is obviously the Surgeon General. But um, in, as America's doctor, he's responsible for sharing scientific information with us, but one of the things I so appreciate, appreciate about you is that you really want us to move towards a pre prevention-based society, and so he's obviously a supreme expert to help us learn how to help all of us really stay active and healthy forever. Mayor Matt Hayek, um, he's done actually pretty rem remarkable things as the mayor of Iowa City. It's been that way since 2010, but you know, Iowa City is no a regular city when it comes to helping all of it, helping their residents live well at any age. Iowa City was the number one in the top 20 small metros on best cities for successful aging, so really well done. We look forward to hearing what you're doing in your community. Kevin Washington, uh, Mr. Washington, President and CEO of the YMCA and since uh, February 2015, but he's been with the organization for some 36 years and what we're really interested to hear about is an or, uh, initiative that he and uh, Dr. Murthy are setting forward to really cooperate together to challenge WISE across the nation to host intergenerational physical activity events. I'm really looking forward to how we're going to help younger and older Americans be healthy. And lastly, but certainly not least, uh, Mr. Fernando Torres Hill, I'll say the G like an H, like you recommended, <laughs> is director of the Center for Policy Research on Aging at UCLA. But 
Yeah, I was, I was quite impressed with how vast and long your experience goes back to President Jimmy Carter and even as the uh, appointed um, the, to the Federal Council on Aging and under President Bill Clinton, who appointed you as the first ever U.S. Assistant Secretary on Aging. Pretty remarkable. So, and he's going sh to sh share a unique perspective with, you know, how can we help the elderly especially, but even with a, a disability, you know, he doesn't let that hold him back and he's going to help others, you know, do the same. So, I'm going to start with an opening question for all of them. You certainly answer it from your perspective, your areas of expertise. But what I really would like to know is, you know, can you share really your important steps that individuals, families, or communities, based on your experience, can take to help all of us stay healthy and thriving for, for really years to come? You know, for me, Michael, first of all, what a privilege to be here. You know, the president speaks. We're with the Surgeon General. Uh, the CEO of the AARP, all my esteemed uh, panelists, it's not only, as uh, President Obama said so um, poignantly today, we judge a society by how we treat our seniors, uh, but it is a growing uh, dilemma and crisis in our particular society. The numbers are escalating exponentially. And something you just struck on, Michael, is is kind of, where I live, and that is that so many people today, of course, are addressing care and crucial um, food and daily human rights needs, but there's also the issue of respect and where we are in our youth-driven society. And when I walked up onto that beach, Labor Day, um, Cuba to Florida, those 53 hours after trying for 35 years, the first words I said, we're never, ever give up. And the world can relate to that. It doesn't matter what your other shore is. You may be battling cancer. If you want to get to that other shore, you will find a way. But the second thing I said was, you're never too old to chase your dreams. And here we are, you know, agreed. I'm a young 65, not quite 95 yet, but there's a young 93-year-old right here still chasing dreams. And to me, it's vitally important that that word intergenerational that you're going to talk about comes into play. And we've got a magical time for it with the Internet. Kids, yes, I spoke to my baby boomers when I stood on that beach, but kids, the millennials, teenagers, little kids this big come up to me and grab my legs and cry and say, you showed me I can be anything I want in this world. And it's our time. It's our time to thrive. I feel that I am in the prime of my life sitting here at 65, not just as we all do as we get older emotionally, you know, and in a mature sort of way, but physically I am the athlete that's better than when I was 25. So that's not true for all people, but the least we can do, which my best friend and my head handler on the swims, who is with me in the front row here today, Bonnie Stoll, we next year are gonna walk. The least we can do is walk, disabled included. And when I say walk, I mean roll. From Los Angeles, Right here to the Washington Mall, we're going to go all the way cross country next year. We're going to try to get a million people to participate. And when we wind up on the Washington Mall, we're going to say, you know what? We all care, Republicans and Democrats and white and black and old and young, about the collective health of, of America. And if we become a nation of walkers, we're already starting. People are wearing their Fitbits and their Garmin. If we, that day that we arrive here, de decide to become a rabid nation of walkers, walk after dinner, walk to work, walk at lunch. In 10 years, we will literally see the social change and the YMCA's of America, I hope, uh, join us. We are going to see the numbers of childhood diabetes and heart disease and obesity and depression and all the things that come with inactivity improve. So that's my next cause. Mayor? Well, so... Uh, Michael, thanks for introducing me as an expert on aging. I, I am not, and I do not play an expert on TV either, but I am the mayor of, of Iowa City, which uh, is a vibrant 
uh, university community in the Midwest um, and ended up number one on the Milken uh, Institute's uh, index for successful aging uh, cities. And we were, we were really uh, surprised and, and, and tickled to get, to get that honor. Um, you know, we, we have a lot of built-in advantages. We've got a, a, a massive healthcare system in Iowa City relative to our population. We give uh, Rochester, Minnesota a run for its money in terms of physicians per capita. You know, we've got a vibrant arts and culture scene and, and, and a lot of things that make us an attractive community. But I, don't, I, I think communities that are, that are or environments that are attractive uh, uh, to seniors and conducive to successful aging and, and place don't necessarily occur naturally. I think they occur as the result of a lot of work on the part of local governments and nonprofits and, and the private sector. And those are things that have to be created and you have to have strong networks. Local governments have an important role to play. Everyone lives in a community and everyone is affected by a local government. And cities can do a lot. Um, we try to look at everything we do, whether it's our budget or our legislative process or our ordinances. Um, or our programming through the lens of uh, our, our, our senior population. Um, and we do that for a lot of other constituencies as well, but I think we've done a really good job uh, in, in this category. And so, for example, in the area of housing, there are things we can do and any city can do. You know, we, we incent senior housing, uh, and we can do that in ways that involve money, and we can do that in ways that just uh, provide uh, incentives to build more of it. Things as simple as reducing the parking requirements in, in new construction areas or, or, or uh, density bonuses that encourage uh, more housing, uh, or, or requiring that new construction involve the kind of construction or the kind of interior construction that can be readapted over time to allow people to age in place. Something as simple as uh, the way doors are framed on the inside of a, of a house or a condominium, setting that up so that in 10 or 20 or 30 years time, those doors can be widened at a, at, at, with minimal expense to, to, to do that. Uh, in the area of transit, we have a, a complete streets uh, uh, a policy which requires us, anytime we're doing work within our right of ways, uh, which traditionally have been viewed as, as the home of the automobile to the exclusion of people who are walking around bicycles, our policy now requires us to look at all forms of transportation, including walking and bicycling, and that has an impact on seniors. We, we require uh, accessibility, we promote uh, the walking and the bicycling experience. We think that has a, a big impact on, on, on seniors. Um, and, and our overall zoning uh, is geared to encourage mixed use development so that people are living closer to the services they need, whether it's a grocery store uh, or, or a retail shop. Uh, and then our programming you know, runs the gamut from, from a vibrant senior center that, that's one part wellness center and, and, and one part uh, learning and, and, and arts environment to, to a dedicated uh, commission of, 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 of citizens who, who advise us on, on issues and we assess our needs from time to time uh, to working with all the nonprofits in our community who are filling the gaps. Um, and we, as an entitlement city, um, in any city over a certain threshold of population is, is an entitlement city, we receive uh, uh, federal funding. And in the case of uh, community development block grant and, and home funding, we use those sources to, uh, to, to promote the sort of work, the, the work that our nonprofits are doing. Um, I, I, none of these things are, are, are by themselves home runs. And I don't think local governments are in a position to hit home runs on this kind of issue. I think uh, you can hit a lot of singles, though, and that's how we get there. And every little thing counts. Every little uh, housing development or program or outreach uh, matters. And we work closely in, uh, in partnership with, with the nonprofits. And our goal is to make our community uh, welcoming to seniors. Um, and we want to reduce isolation. Um, and we want seniors to have a purposeful existence, and they have a huge role in our community, and we, we try to champion that. Yeah, I would like to say, I think you... Yeah, I think you downplay your expertise in this area, but I would also say that why his comments are so critically important is in this case, and I can say this as a doctor, doctors are not the answer. Really, communities are the answer here because you live and breathe with every day and you're helping these people at a level that is so critical to really help us get to where we need to be. Dr. Murthy? Sure. Well, thank you. And it is an honor to be with all of you today and an honor to be with my esteemed panelists uh, who bring a wealth of very interesting experiences and perspectives to the table. So I'm excited to hear from all of you today. A couple of thoughts that I'll share with you. You know, when I was sitting, um, sitting uh, in the conference this morning and listening to, to our president speak, 
there was one thought that, uh, that came to my mind, which was a lesson that my parents taught me when I was very young. Uh, when we used to go visit our, our grandparents uh, in India, they would always teach us that when we left after a visit, that we would always bow down, touch their feet, uh, and take their blessings before we went. And the reason we did that is because it was a show of respect to them. It was a way in which we honored the wisdom that they had, the years that they had spent on this earth, uh, and the tremendous experience that they were able to bring to making our lives and lives of our communities better. Uh, and all of that was captured in a, in a simple uh, but important symbolic gesture. And I think about, I thought about that this morning, but I've thought about that often because I do, as I travel around the country, see people of all ages from communities big and small. But one of the things that strikes me often when I travel is that our most important resource as a country is our people. And among all of our people, it is our elders, it is our seniors that have great extraordinary repositories of wisdom experience that we need to draw from while we're at the same time seeking to innovate and develop new solutions. We can't forget the lessons that we've learned from the past. And so that's why I believe this conference and the work that we are collectively doing to support uh, people as they age is so vitally important uh, to the future of America and really to the future of the world. Uh, this is also important to so many of our families because all of us know people who are aging. Some of us are, all of us are aging at, you know, regardless of what age we're at, to be clear. But, you know, for some of us, it's more acutely, um, you know, evident than others. My mother uh, is actually turning 65 and uh, will be on Medicare next year. Uh, she probably will not like the fact that I mentioned that on a broadcast uh, that is going nationally, but it's the case. And so I find myself often thinking more uh, about her health. Uh, my father has been on Medicare for a number of years, and very often when I go home and speak to my parents, the conversations that we have are about how they can stay healthy and independent as they get older, uh, recognizing that they want to be a part of their kids' lives, but they don't want to be dependent on their kids uh, for everything. So, so these are important. They're very personal, I know, to all of us. One overarching thought that I want to share, though, is that in order to create better health uh, for our aging population, I believe it's essential for us to build a culture of prevention in America. We spend a lot of resources and time investing in treatment, as we should, uh, because we have made extraordinary advances in treatment. We have many people who suffer from illness who need those advances. As a physician, I myself have been part of delivering uh, so much of the benefit that has been accrued through years of research uh, to patients at their bedside, and I'm very grateful uh, to have had that privilege. But while we invest a great deal in treatment, we don't invest nearly as much in prevention and ensuring that we are as good at preventing illness as we are at treating it. But this is actually, I believe, what we're called to do now, particularly, although not exclusively, uh, for our aging citizens. Now, you can look at some of the measures and think, well, we're doing a pretty good job already. You know, 75%, for example, uh, of uh, el you know, older adults feel that their health is in good, very good, or excellent shape, and that's good. But what I worry about is that we have the potential to slip in these statistics and to go backward because of some really concerning trends, uh, because of the very high rate uh, of obesity that we have in this country, because of the uh, extraordinary rate of chronic disease that we have with almost one in every two adults uh, being impacted by some sort of chronic illness. We also have uh, significant problems in terms of our trend in physical activity. Only 50% roughly of Adults get the amount of physical activity they need every, you know, every day, every, every week, every year. And that number is around 25% uh, when it comes to, to adolescents. So these are, these are concerning. But I believe that the way to overcome some of these concerning trends, the way to build the foundation for a strong of America is to create a culture of prevention that has three pillars to it. Uh, those being strong and healthy nutrition, uh, being physical activity, and also being uh, emotional and mental well-being. We have to build and support and sustain those pillars if we want to really create a culture of prevention. But the part of this work is, is structural work. And as the mayor mentioned, there are important things that we can do in our communities in terms of how we build our neighborhoods to uh, make them more amenable to physical activity and to make them safer as well. How we make food accessible and affordable uh, to people, nutritious food in particular. Uh, how we make mental health care services uh, available, but also how we build in a culture of emotional well-being from the earliest days in school itself. These are all structural changes that we can make in our neighborhoods and our communities that are essential. But structure alone is not the solution to building a culture of prevention, because what we also have to do is we have to change norms. We have to change uh, norms such that healthier choices are not just easier, but they're also more desirable. 
the analogy that somebody uh, gave to me once is they said, you know, if I approached you with a cookie in one hand and an apple in the other, such that you had no barriers to access and both were free, uh, what would make the decision uh, of the difference between which choice you made? Those are often driven by our beliefs, our practices, the things we see around us. And that is why it's actually so essential for communities and local leaders to be involved in creating this culture of prevention. Because culture, as much as we might think is uh, the case, does not get generated from Washington, D.C. or from uh, the top down. It gets often generated very locally. Uh, and as I've traveled, I've seen actually very interesting examples of how local communities are shaping uh, cultural norms. When I went to Birmingham, Alabama, I met with a, a pastor there of a, a very large church who said that he made a decision with the other church leaders uh, to change what they offered in terms of food uh, every Sunday. And they made one simple, well, I shouldn't say simple, they made one very difficult for them uh, transition, which is to go from fried chicken to baked chicken. And they said, uh, and he, he told me, he said, look, I'm a son of the South, and I grew up on fried chicken, and this was extremely difficult for me to swallow. But, <laughs> but he said he did it, and about a month in, he thought, you know, this baked chicken tastes pretty good. And it turned out that when I came there, which is probably a year or more later after they started this program, everyone was eating baked chicken there, you know, at the church on Sunday. And a lot of people, including him, had actually changed what they were doing at home. So we can change norms and culture and practices based on what we do in our neighborhoods. And that's actually, I believe, what we're called to do right now. And I'll mention one last point, which is that is to recognize how important it is uh, for us to build this culture of prevention, particularly for our aging population. In, 20, in 2016, we will be releasing uh, a healthy aging action report as part of the uh, national prevention strategy. Uh, in 2011, as some of you may know, we built the nation's first strategy for prevention called the National Prevention Strategy. Uh, that has helped communities across the country to think about how to shift uh, and build this, this culture of prevention uh, in their neighborhoods. But we will be releasing this Healthy Aging Action Plan to talk specifically about how we can apply this to the aging population, ensure those benefits uh, get to all parts of America. So in closing, I'll just say that this culture of prevention is essential for people of all ages. But I believe that in order for us to really create uh, a, a culture and an environment uh, that can support our aging Americans, prevention needs to be at the heart of that. So they gave me the enviable task of following the Surgeon General. I'll be brief and talk about the YMCA. And I know a lot of you are saying, what is the YMCA doing up here? What do they have to offer in this regard? Well, a couple of things. One, this population of 60 and above is our fastest growing members. We have over 3.5 million members that are members of YMCA. Two, we see ourselves as where social meets health. The combination of those two ingredients. In our facilities and our opportunities, we talk about spirit, mind, and body. All of those things we know play an essential role in helping people live a very full life. More importantly, it's an opportunity to create op ways where folks can get away from isolation, depression, and other things of that nature. I can tell you, in YMCA's, there are many what we call breakfast clubs where folks come together and have the opportunity to meet on a regular basis to ensure that they have this connection, to ensure that they continue to live a full and healthy life. Secondly, earlier today, the president and some others talked about scale. When we talk about scale, trying to deliver programs on a wide basis, we are 880 associations, 2,700 branches, but we're in 10,000 communities as an organization. And when you want to talk about doing something on a large scale and also taking into account the differences that those communities have, well, we see ourselves as a partner in making some of those things happen across this country. Physical activity, which we talked about with the uh, Surgeon General, is an opportunity to ensure that everyone has a way to engage in that work through, those, through the YMCA. So we look forward to working with several others. We're also doing some significant work, which we'll talk a little bit about, around our diabetes prevention. We know that diabetes is, in fact, one of the most chronic diseases in this country. We know it's preventable. And at the YMCA, we've been working 1,200 communities across this country with individuals to ensure that their pre-diabetes never turns into diabetes. And the age group that has been the most successful is the 60 and over. Those individuals attend. We have a 16-week session. They attend by far the most sessions, 14 out of the 16, they're 10. 
and 71% of them do not get diabetes because of the work that we're engaged in with them. So we see, we really see ourselves as this organization where health and social meet, and we can play a significant role in reducing health care costs, but also in helping our, our seniors, and I'm soon to be one, to move into a much more physical activity lifestyle, have an opportunity to live a longer and healthy and more productive life. And more importantly, we also have a significant number of volunteers who are engaged in work with us as well. So we see ourselves as that organization that can partner with so many others to ensure that there's a place in their communities that they can engage in physical activity, social, uh, social time, and have an opportunity to really, really live a much fuller, healthier lifestyle. Thank you. And I believe I'm the uh, cleanup batter here. And uh, uh, it's both a, a pleasure but also intimidating to follow such a distinguished panel. Thank you for having me with you. Like all of us, I'm thrilled to be here at the 2015 White House Conference on Aging, uh, both as a person that's older, a person aging with a disability, but also uh, as a board member of uh, AARP. And also, as a Californian, and let me give a shout out to California, it's been, it's been raining in Washington, D.C., and I'll do my best to bring it back to the West Coast. Uh, but also, uh, this is my fifth White House Conference on Aging. Uh, Mr. Nash, I could not be at the 1961. I was just in junior high, uh, but I've been making, thank you for your blessings, I've been making up up for it ever since and and uh, two uh, quick messages that I may may leave the first about uh, how we stay active and healthy regardless of our conditions but also the issues of an intergenerational society that is becoming ethnic and racially diverse I'm a polio survivor and I've been aging with the disability and uh, unlike some stereotypes that you have to be a virile, you know, physically active, perfect body to feel good about yourself, I've never felt healthier or happier than I do now as a polio survivor growing older with this disability. Thank you. And I attribute that to the messages that all of you have been giving, that regardless of our age, Regardless of our condition, whether it's physical, intellectual, cognitive, or otherwise, we can still be active. I do Pilates. I do swimming. I do modified Tai Chi and Qigong. Even in my wheelchair, I can stretch. I can move. And so whatever our conditions are, life is good at any age as long as we keep the mantra that is here, which is we stay active and we stay engaged. My next message is that we're a society becoming much different as we get older. I think it's known pretty much now that we are becoming more diverse. While this country is getting older and baby boomers are reaching 65 and beyond, we are also becoming more ethnically, racially diverse. And when I am 75 or 80, this nation will be a majority minority nation. Therefore, a challenge and an opportunity I would like to leave us with is how to break down the walls. Break down the walls between age, between young and old, among ethnic racial minority groups, among those that are physically dis disabled and the rest of you that are only temporarily able. And to break down those walls so that we can not only have a healthier, older, more diverse society, but we can show the world, we can show the world that the United States, as it becomes demographically transformed into a more diverse, older society, that the United States is even greater for those demographic opportunities. And I believe we can do it in this conference and with the leadership of the president and all of us here. I believe we can be the role model for all of us and for the nation. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I mean, your comments are just 
I don't even know how we follow all that. That was amazing. But I wanted to hear a little bit more about the, the joint venture between the Surgeon General and the YMCA about the, what you're doing to increase intergenerational connections and increase physical activity. What kind of work are you do, guys doing together? Well, I'll give you an overview of the collaboration that we've developed, and I'm, I'm going to let Kevin fill in some of the details. But one of the things that, that we are both very concerned about is how to get America moving again. And this is a passion I know many of us share, uh, and many of you share uh, in the room and around the country. And he, let me tell you about why. Because while we can think about physical activity as a chore that needs to be done a few times a week, you know, or a, P, you know, a chore that has to be done in a class in school, it is far more than that. As we know, for example, that physical activity can be very helpful in reducing the risk of chronic disease. It can be helpful, helpful in managing chronic disease and contributing to emotional well-being, mental function. It has multiple, multiple benefits. And our, the challenge we, we are trying to take on is how do we make physical activity more and more a part of people's day? How do we make it something that is engaging and exciting? How do we essentially rebuild activity back into our culture? Uh, that's a challenge that we have taken on. And we've done it uh, taking an intergenerational approach, uh, bringing younger and older people together uh, to walk uh, through a program that we will be launching soon called New Way to Move. And in this program, we'll be looking to bring older and younger Americans together to actually walk together uh, so that younger uh, Americans can teach our older Americans new ways to move and so that older Americans can teach uh, younger Americans about the importance of physical activity and how to actually keep it uh, you know, in your life and make it a part of your day-to-day -day routine. Uh, so that's part of what we will be doing together uh, starting next month in August. And let me have Kevin fill in uh, some more information about that. Well, we're saying we're, we're challenging all our wives across this country to have intergenerational activities, uh, going to day camp. You know, wives are very creative. And wait, let me ask, how many Y members are in the room? Let me, come, ask, how many of you had learned to swim at the Y? Say, how many of you went to camp at the Y? See, the YMCA is a truly American story that we can work together on. And we do want to do an intergenerational approach. So Ys are very creative, intergenerational walks. You're going to spend a day at day camp. You won't be a counselor, but you have an opportunity to engage with, with the young kids then walking around and doing playing games. Pickleball. How many play pickleball? opportunity to play pickleball with some of our kids as well. And in addition, you having opportunity to come to day camp with your kids and engage in activities and doing walks and things of that nature to ensure that they'll learn as much from you as you will from them. And we think it's a great opportunity to get intergenerational kids and families together to enjoy the physical activity opportunities that will be engaged in the YMCA. So starting August, first week in August, you'll be here and we'll be tweeting it and on Facebook. And I know many of you have your Facebook pages. Get on it and go to your local Y have an opportunity to engage in activity that's going to help you create physical activity for your community. So we're looking forward to doing that. Thank you. And one uh, note I just want to add to this is that while we are building this program together uh, with the YMCA, which is an extraordinary organization, when you go back to your communities uh, across the country, we also want you to remember that you don't need to build a whole new program in order to build physical activity back into your life or into the lives of people around you. But there are actually simple things that we can do in our everyday life to get more active. One of the strategies, for example, that I started uh, you know, taking a couple of years ago uh, with my fiance is we decided to, we realized we were spending a lot of, times in, a lot of time in meetings. My guess is that's true for many of us uh, you know, around the country. And so we started shifting our uh, sitting meetings to walking meetings, a simple thing, you know, which allowed us to actually build a lot more steps in. And the reason we knew just how many steps is because we were both involved in Fitbit challenges at the time and were tracking our steps. Uh, and I realized that just in the process of doing meetings, uh, that my fiance was racking up thousands and thousands and thousands of steps. And, uh, and it was really extraordinary to see just w how one change like that can make a really big difference uh, over the course of the day. Later this year, we're uh, from our office also going to be releasing uh, a call to action on walking and walkable communities, recognizing that we only, not only want to build a national movement around walking, but we also want to make sure that everyone in America lives in a neighborhood and a place where they can walk safely. Uh, you know, sometimes when I was a, a practicing medicine up in Boston before I started in this job, uh, very often, if I had patients who were trying to lose weight, I would counsel them on the importance of being active and would recommend to them that they go for a walk after dinner. But sometimes it took me a while to realize that for, for many patients, uh, depending on where they lived, 
going for a walk after dinner was putting your life at risk yeah, because they lived in neighborhoods which were frankly not safe. And so that's really where the rubber meets the road. And that's why, as was mentioned earlier, the problem solving the challenges that we face on health uh, will not be met by simply putting more nurses and doctors you know, into communities across America. While that's an important part of the solution, we have to go further and actually create changes on a structural and cultural level to really enable people to uh, build lives that enable physical activity, good nutrition, and emotional and mental well-being. You know, if I could jump in, and, and perhaps uh, if we would be so fortunate on our, what we're calling the walk across America, which by the way would have legs, so to speak, for years to come, and the big one is 2016 summer, April to September walk all the way across the nation. So that's a huge time commitment. Most people won't go the whole way. They'll join for uh, walk the state of Kentucky or walk four days on a weekend or something. But then just right gloving in with your vision through the whys of America of becoming this nation of walkers, intergenerational, kids with grandparents, et cetera, that every summer we plan to do the walk, walk New England, walk the Pacific Northwest, perhaps walk Cuba, um, hand in hand together. And the fundraising for us, we don't want people to pay a dime. To be part of the walk, you show up, we will feed you, we will make sure you're medically safe, uh, we will get you across. But we are going to raise money as we go toward the future walkers of America and all those schools that have lost phys ed. We are hopefully going to, if the State Board of Pennsylvania comes to us afterwards and says, you know, almost every public school in the state of Pennsylvania from junior high school through high school has lost physical education. Those kids sit and read screens during that free hour that we will install a walking monitor Someone, a retired person who would love to go over to that school every day and take a walk with those kids safely around that neighborhood. Um, so I, I, I'd be so excited to help you, Kevin, Dr. Murthy, and what you're doing. And uh, perhaps we would have those same group of walkers uh, begin, beginning that march toward the future walking of America. Yeah. Yeah. And um, just to follow up on the conversation, and the Surgeon General talked about the importance of changing norms, changing how we view longevity. I am hopeful, as a college professor, many of my undergraduates are millennials, and uh, you would think they'd be the least interested in these issues. I introduce them to what I call a personal longevity plan, and I ask these 18, 19-year-olds to assume you will live to be 100 years of age. How will you plan out your life? At first, of course, they were a little shocked. Why should that matter to me? But when we are through with the assignment, they take it seriously and they start realizing, I have to plan for turning 25, 50, 75, 100. I think one of our challenges is how to get society beyond the big D, as in David, which is denial, the big denial. And AARP, for example, has a campaign called Reimagining Aging, Reimagining Aging. So I hope we can take some of those concepts so we can excite the country that with this gift of longevity, we now need to plan for that longer lifespan. And, and Dr. Torres Gill, you, you talk about exciting the country. I, I, I like that point. I think we have an opportunity as a, as a nation to excite local governments as well. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits of this, uh, uh, you know, this population boom, the baby boomers retiring and the huge demographic increase we're seeing at, the, at that level of our, of our society. But we should be expecting local governments to respond to these issues and, and, and pushing local governments to look within their operations to see what they can do to facilitate successful aging in place. You can spend money, and that's obviously necessary, but you can do many other things as a local government. And looking at your building codes and your zoning, your approach to zoning and your, and your programming and things like that, and spending small amounts of money can make a huge difference. We've got a program that provides micro grants or, or micro loans, depending on the case, uh, to individuals who need modest repairs in, in their residences. And sometimes $500 or $2,000 or $5,000 makes all the difference between that person aging in place for another 5, 10, 15 years and moving to another more expensive facility that has all sorts of other uh, disadvantages. And so we need to push local governments to do that. I'd also say that local governments should view this as an opportunity. 
Um, not only do, do seniors within a community enrich the fabric of a community uh, and play important roles on, on commissions and, and elected positions and whatnot, but this is economic development. Seniors uh, should be a demographic the local governments are going after. And, and they, they represent consumers, they represent taxpayers, they represent all sorts of things that any community, especially in areas of the country where, where, uh, uh, where we're losing population, this is an opportunity. Thank you, everyone. That was, I mean, it's, I feel like we could just talk about this all day, but unfortunately we're out of time and so we're gonna have to wrap it up. And if you have any questions, you have to try to grab it all the experts afterwards. Thank you. Thank you.